Viewed from space, Earth looks peaceful and serene. Life on the blue planet has evolved and is sustained due to a fine balance between the Earth's position in the solar system, its atmosphere and its climate. That balance is now under threat. Our climate is changing significantly as human activity exacerbates natural global warming. If we keep on as we are at present, the carbon dioxide content is going up year by year and its rate of increase is getting faster. Ultimately, it, would, it will affect the whole world, of course, if it continues. I think this is the big problem, in fact, with the whole question of climate change. We're entering uncharted territory. We're changing the system and we don't know where we're going. And we don't know with real confidence what the consequences will be. In fact, my own feeling is the likelihood is there will be unanticipated changes. Irish scientists have developed some very successful weather forecasting systems and are now at the international forefront of the search using those systems to help create more accurate climate change prediction for Ireland and the world. Almost every aspect of our lives is affected to some degree by the weather. Ireland has a temperate maritime climate, which avoids the extremes of either hot or cold. But it's also inherently unpredictable, as we're constantly being subjected to short-term weather events, such as storms and flooding, causing mayhem around the country and costing millions of euro worth of damage. Peter Lynch is one of Ireland's foremost meteorologists. The weather and climate affect essentially everything that we do. They're of interest and importance to everybody, and they have huge economic implications. Virtually every industry and transport and health and tourism, so on, all these areas are impacted in a major way. One of the challenges facing forecasters like Lynch is how to convert weather observations into data form, which can then be processed into accurate forecasting. The atmosphere and the ocean are physical systems, so of course they're governed by physical principles, and these are expressed as mathematical equations. We have, for example, Newton's law, which relates acceleration to force. We have Boyle's law, which relates pressure and volume, and so on. We have a complete system of equations which describe the way the atmosphere and ocean move. And when we put these together into a computer program, that's what we call a model. These equations, when processed by a computer model, can give certain predictions. Peter Lynch has developed a sophisticated algorithm called digital filtering which has been used by the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting in Reading in the UK. The resulting forecasts are recognised as the most accurate in the world. The procedures which uh, Peter has invented and, and formulated are crucial to uh, weather forecasting. Weather forecasting these days, it's a very sophisticated mathematical enterprise. Progress has been made because people with very strong mathematical backgrounds have been able to make contributions, and Peter is one of those. Accurate weather forecasting relies on not one set, but a whole series of predictions. One technique is known as the ensemble system, and Peter's work has played a key role in improving the clarity of the overall picture that it gives. 
This is a display showing the evolution of the atmosphere over a 10-day period. Now, as time goes on, we can see how things develop. We notice a feature here, for example, which develops over a couple of days into a hurricane. It's not the only hurricane on the chart. You see here it's deeper still, and by 10 days, it's a very pronounced feature. Now, where that's going to go next, that's really very difficult to say with confidence, but the probability of different occurrences can be estimated by the ensemble technique. And these charts here show the output of the EPS system. And the ensemble prediction system runs not a single forecast, but 50 or 51 different forecasts from slightly different initial conditions, so that by just nudging the atmosphere a little bit at the beginning, the subsequent development may be changed. For example, the track of that hurricane might change. And we can get an estimate of the likely developments by studying the pattern in the different ensemble members. The ensemble system has been very successfully used in short to medium term weather forecasting. But is it possible that it could form the basis of part of a broader system for use in longer range climate change prediction? We know that increasing greenhouse gases will warm the globe, but increasingly people want to know more than that. They want to know how the weather will actually change under global warming. And it turns out that really to answer that problem as quantitatively as possible, the weather forecasting models actually provide the best basis for answering that problem. We can't really make a one-month weather forecast, so how can we possibly make a 100-year climate forecast? The answer is that we're trying to predict something different. For climate modeling, we're not trying to predict individual storms and individual events. We're trying to predict basically the statistics of the atmosphere. What will the average temperature be like? What will the overall pattern of rainfall be? And how will they change? And that can be done in quite a robust way with the climate models. One of the key elements feeding into long-term climate models will be the behaviour of the Earth's atmosphere. One Irish investigator, Professor Ray Bates in UCD, is one of the world's leading experts in this field. Bates research looks at the CO2 and all the other physical elements that make up the Earth's atmosphere in an effort to understand the dynamics of our climate or weather system. My research is in the theory of climate. That means trying to simplify things down to their essentials to look at particular questions. What keeps the climate stable at its current observed equilibrium temperature? And why doesn't it vary about that. If it does vary, what brings it back? And if it is pushed away from its equilibrium by some external forcing, such as doubling carbon dioxide, for example, that can be called an external forcing, uh, how far does it deviate from its uh, initial equilibrium as a result of that forcing? If there were no atmosphere, our planet would be emitting temperatures at around minus 18 Celsius which is clearly too cold to sustain most life forms. However, there are naturally occurring gases in the atmosphere, such as water vapor and carbon dioxide, which trap the heat and raise the ground temperature of the planet to a comfortable average of about 15 degrees. The enhanced greenhouse effect is what results from increasing amounts of carbon dioxide and the other gases that result from human activities, threatening this present delicate balance between the atmosphere and the Earth. Bates devises simple physics calculations to examine the impact of external factors, such as the enhanced greenhouse effect, on the atmosphere and on our climate as a whole. These equations are the building blocks for all models used for weather prediction and for climate simulation. In the case of weather prediction, the integration is for relatively short periods of time, for some days ahead, a little more than a week ahead. For climate simulation, these equations are integrated for decades or centuries ahead. Bates is carrying out this work in close collaboration with Peter Lynch. Well, we're trying to build as much knowledge as we can into the models so that they're as precise as possible. Uh, well, that means understanding the processes in the atmosphere. 
we're studying the processes at a basic level using the information that we get from those theoretical studies. So it's a kind of a synergy between fundamental science and applied science. There is no doubt that climate change is happening. The great unknown remains what the impact will be. Using the large pool of diverse information which Lynch has built up, he's teamed up with Irish weather forecasters Met Aaron, utilising their data to help create a climate model or projection of what Ireland's climate will be in the future. It's known as the C4I project. Well, we began about uh, five years ago. At that time, we felt that uh, because uh, the, the climate is changing, we can see it in the, the observational records that uh, Met Aaron has. We felt it would be a good idea to, to try to look ahead and to see how climate change might uh, impact on Ireland in, in the future. The C4I project, uh, which was uh, initiated back in 2003, basically it was kicked off by Peter. We have uh, maintained uh, very strong links uh, during the, the running of that project over the, the last uh, five years. In the case of the, the operational weather forecasting system that we run here, it uh, may take maybe an hour and a half to two hours uh, to produce a, a two-day forecast. In the case of running climate models, obviously if you're going to look ahead for the rest of the century, it may take uh, perhaps two or three months of virtually continuous running to produce simulations of uh, the future climate. So you really need uh, supercomputer resources uh, to, to do this. I check the Irish Centre for High-End Computing basically delivers high-end computing resources to Irish academic scientists. By high-end computing, we mean large computers, a thousand times more powerful than your average PC. In climate, we are working with MetAaron and with other groups in universities, such as UCD, to run models at a much finer resolution than were previously available. There are global models that cover the entire Earth, but the price you pay for that is that the resolution of the models is quite coarse. So if you think of representing the climate of, of Ireland by points, those points are rather far apart. A complementary approach then is to nest within that global model a regional climate model with a much finer grid. We simulate the weather at each point on that grid. Previous models might have simulated Earth at a 400 kilometre grid. So we'd measure the weather every 400 kilometres. We have two Blue Jean computers with about 4,000 chips each, compared to an average PC, which would have one chip. So it gives a much larger computational resource, allowing us to run much larger problems in terms of climate than you could do on an average computer. Blue Jean allows us to run our models to much greater resolution to go from, by say, 100 kilometres down to 15 kilometres. So we could say the weather for Kerry rather than the weather for Ireland. Five years into the C4I project, the team has recently published its findings to date. I think there's no real doubt that the warming will continue for the next 50 to 100 years. We're really committed to that because of the levels that CO2 has already reached. So the temperature increase will be probably for Ireland three or four degrees towards the end of the century. Also, a fairly robust signal is that the rainfall patterns will change. Simply put, more rainfall in the winter, less in the summer. And if we look at the geographical distribution over Ireland, it looks as if there will be more rainfall in the west and less in the east. We have indications that the occurrence of flooding in the southeast of the country may become worse than it is at present. We've seen significant flooding events, say, on the Blackwater River, on the shore in Clonmel. And one of the interesting indications from the models is that the occurrence of extreme events will become more frequent. So although the overall rainfall in the summer might be less, it will occur in short, sharp bursts, which could be very damaging. Clonmel has been one of those towns hardest hit by increased incidents of flooding. Planners and engineers are taking advantage of this kind of information to develop a number of solutions to both anticipate and deal with these events. We're on the western side of Clonmel here, and during flood events, this whole area around us becomes inundated. We are currently standing on a recently constructed embankment. It's approximately four metres high. And when the scheme is complete, it will tie into other defences, just as sheet piled walls and reinforced concrete walls, which will protect the whole area. A flood warning system has been developed. This system predicts what level the river will rise to and at what time. Once a certain threshold is predicted, 
the system issues a warning to the authorities, who then put in operation the erection of the demountable flood defences. Beside me here, we have the flood defence wall at full, full height level, and here is a low level wall, which still provides the immunity of the river to the public. This low level wall can receive a demountable barrier system to bring the defence up to the required height. As planners and engineers look to the future, to anticipate the likely impacts of climate change, others are looking to the past, some as far back as 20,000 years ago. At one time, the entire continent was buried under huge ice sheets. As they started to retract or deglaciate, they left indelible marks on the landscape, resulting in features such as drumlins, lakes and cliffs. Today, University of Ulster's Paul Dunlop is investigating the patterns left by the departure of the last ice sheet to see what answers it might yield. When you take a look at the Irish landscape, it would have been totally uh, different from what we, what we see today. Obviously, there would have been a very large ice sheet uh, sitting on top of most of the landscape anyway. The main things that they understand about ice sheets is that they're very sort of sensitive to climate change and they also are known to drive uh, climate change as well. And uh, the Irish landscape has a rich geological record of that. Well, what you're looking at really is the landscape that's sort of sited between Ballymoney, which is just, just down there behind us here, and the large sort of mountains in the background are the sort of is the uplands of the Antrim Plateau. Now, in terms of age, the Antrim Plateau is much uh, older, older formation. And the landscape in between is basically what's called known as sort of drumlin topography, which are these sort of small elongated streamlined hills you can see with a sort of they're sort of much deeper uh, on this end, and you can see them tapering down towards the left hand side there. Now what they do is they record ice flow direction. The sort of tapered lead points towards where the ice was flowing. So what we're looking at is basically ice age deposits, and we can basically use those landforms to tell us which way the ice was sliding, which is basically coming from the south towards the north. So this ice flow was generated in the Loch Ness Basin and moved its way northward towards the coastline of Northern Ireland. Find these landforms all around Ireland, all pointing out offshore, so we can clearly see evidence that the ice sheet in the last ice age way, way out on the continental shelf. Dunlop is part of a special expedition aboard the Marine Institute's Celtic Explorer research vessel, which plans to take samples from Drumlins which may still be present on the Atlantic Ocean seabed. The crew are interpreting the 3D bathymetric map, which appears to highlight glacial drumlins, but they won't know for sure until they get the core samples back on board the boat. The sort of multicoloured map that we're looking at is basically the bathymetry off, offshore around the coast of Donegal. And then this blue area is actually the land. So what we know from the, the glacial record onshore, we've got large drumlin fields and the drumlins are all basically oriented under the bay. So we know that the ice basically was flowing towards the bay out onto the continental shelf. And there's this large marina that cuts across Donegal Bay. What we're going to do here is basically drop the core to either side and on top of that ridge and try and retrieve some of the sort of sediment that we, we can use to try and understand the sort of sequence of sort of glacial and deglacial events that happened in Donegal Bay. The chief scientist aboard the boat is Sara Benetti. She will be overseeing the capturing of the sediment samples and will also be analysing the data when the expedition returns. Well, I'm very much looking forward to it, especially because um, there are not that many calls from this part of the world, um, especially not in the area and in this area, and especially not from the last Irish ice sheet. So I'm very much looking forward to it. If the samples are in fact from an underwater glacial drumlin, this will help the investigators to better understand the dynamics of the ancient ice sheet and help them to predict the behaviour of modern ice sheets. We only have two large ice sheets at the moment. We've got the Greenland ice sheet, we've got the Antarctic ice sheet, and we know that they're going to respond to global warming, they're going to melt. And what we can use, we can use these glacial deposits here to understand how the Irish ice sheet broke up, and we can possibly use that to try and understand how the Antarctic or the Greenland ice sheet may also respond to global warming in the future. We use the word cryosphere to describe the ice, and that is one component and a vital component of the entire Earth system. 
So the ice interacts with the ocean, the ocean interacts with the atmosphere, the atmosphere interacts with the land, and so it goes. All the subsystems are interacting with each other and influencing each other. So we have to have them all in comprehensive Earth system models. We have to represent the ice as accurately as we can. And of course, to do that, we've got to study it as extensively as we can. It's sort of providing really sort of uh, critical information on the operation of the last ice sheet here, and also basically it fits into a very larger climate story that the, the large sort of global body of scientists are trying to understand. And this sort of this sort of data set that we can get from this trip is very unique in that that regard. It's going to provide brand new data to the western margin of the British Irish ice sheet. So it's going to be really really good data. The Celtic explorer has returned, and having cored over 50 sites, Sara Benetti is pleased that the trip has been a success, and that for the first time ever, they have recovered genuine Irish glacial sediments from the continental shelf, which can now be analysed. Well, it's very exciting, because we, we had a very good cruise and collected lots of material, and from what we saw, from the course we opened on board is that we really targeted the right spots and we know we have recovered glacial sediments. It's clear that the samples vary greatly in their composition according to how the glacier deposited its sediment as it melted. This core, the first one here, is from a drumling just off of northern Donegal. And you can see that the sediment here is very coarse and unsorted, we say. So we have mud, we have sand, we have gravel. While the other core is from uh, the inner part of Donegal Bay, and it's mainly sand at the top, and it grades into mud at the bottom there very stiff mud that it's probably glacially derived too. And so it's these two different cores are two different glacial environments. So the ice is not just one big block of ice moving as one, but you have uh, slower uh, flowing parts, faster flowing parts. And the different type of sediments that we find in different areas are telling us something about how the ice was moving in different areas of the shelf. Benetti can tell a certain amount at first glance, but in order to draw accurate conclusions, she will need to analyse the material in some depth, and it will be a year or two before she can produce more detailed results. Understanding the processes of melting glaciers will add to a wide range of new data which will form an integral part of global climate models of the future. As the quantity and complexity of the information increases, the computer power required will have to be even more sophisticated to keep pace with it. Back at Reading, Lynch and his colleagues are beginning to collaborate to create the most sophisticated climate model yet, which will be known as EC Earth. To succeed, it will require the use of extraordinarily powerful computers. Well, here I am in front of the new computer of the European Centre. This is one of the most powerful computers in the world. It can do something like 100 million million calculations every second. The first computer of the European Centre was called a Cray-1. That could do 100 million calculations a second. But this computer is a million times faster again. And this phenomenal computer speed is needed to integrate modern weather forecasting and climate models. By working towards these new global climate models, it is hoped that we'll be able to make more sense of the unpredictability inherent in the study of climate change. Well, I think the problem of climate change is a very serious one. Pretty much all scientists now accept that. The best means we have of predicting what will happen is through these models. And I'm optimistic because they're improving all the time. I'm sort of thinking 20 years ahead, we may have climate models with a less than one kilometer grid, but that's what we can expect. Better and better, finer and finer, more accurate predictions of what's going to happen. As the work of investigators such as Lynch, Bates, Dunlop and Benetti continues, we're getting closer to getting real insight into the processes and effects of climate change. 
in the hope that we can plan for our future with more certainty and conviction.